Welcome to the study room at Back to the Bible. Hi, I'm Woodrow Kroll. And I'm Tammy Wiseit. We're glad you're joining us for this entire week. We have a great new study, Dr. Kroll. Yeah, in fact, we're continuing our study in the book of Romans this week. Today, actually, we're looking at Romans chapter 3, verses mm -hmm. 9 through 20, kind of a courtroom setting. It is. Paul is going to put all of us in the courtroom, and he's going to follow the traditional courtroom procedures used in the Roman Empire. There will be a charge. There will be some indictments, the counts that tell you your charge is correct. Then there'll be an opportunity for a defense. Finally, there'll be a verdict. And since we're all in the courtroom, this becomes very important for you and me as well today, right here on Back to the Bible. Well, most of us have become uh, thoroughly familiar with courtroom drama by watching it on television. Now, how accurate that drama is, I don't know. But I do know this. The Apostle Paul followed the courtroom procedure of the Roman Empire. And we want to do the same today in Romans chapter 3. Now, think about what Paul has been doing. He wants to prove that we need salvation. So while he begins his message in Romans chapter 1, verses 2 to 6, explaining the gospel, he immediately goes to our need for the gospel, that we are condemned. He's proving what is said in chapter 1, verse 18, that the wrath of God resides on all of us who have suppressed the truth of God. So he's proved that uh, people who do not know the Lord Jesus, people who've never heard the name of Jesus, they're still guilty of their sins because the wrath of God rests on them. He's also proved that moral people, People who uh, live by a certain moral code but don't know the Lord, they still have the wrath of God resting on them. And then he turned his attention to his own people. Paul says, look, I'm Jewish, and, and until I came to know the Lord, I thought I was okay because of Abraham. I'm related to Abraham. I have the covenant of God. I have the circumcision is the, is the sign that I belong to Abraham. I thought I was all set until I discovered I was a sinner. So now, this takes us into chapter 3, when he just puts us right in the middle of a courtroom. And everything that you see here is going to be part of the courtroom drama. Well, let's jump into chapter 3, verse 9. He says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks, Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. Now, the word charge is the key word there, because remember, the very first thing that happens in the courtroom procedure is someone has to charge a person with a crime. And the charge that he gives here is, I I've previously done it, and where he did it was chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. But notice in verse 9, he doesn't say that all have sinned. He says all are under sin. That means we are under the penalty of our sin. That we have sin is a given. That we pay for it, most people don't recognize. So Paul's charge is we are all under the penalty for our sin. Well, that moves him right into the second phase of his legal presentation here, and that is the indictment. Now, ordinarily, you have a one-count indictment to maybe three-count indictment. There are three occasions where the law enforcement people can say, you did this on three different times, or you did three different things. Paul is so thorough in his looking at humanity, standing before God, knowing that we need a Savior, that we are guilty for our sin. Paul is so thorough, he lists no less than 14 counts to the indictment. We're going to see all 14 today. Hold on to your seat because we have to fly through these. Look at verse 10. The first count to the indictment is, as it is written. Now, an indictment has to be a written charge, a formal written accusation charging a person with more or one or more offenses. He says, as it is written. Now, he's probably quoting mainly from Psalm 14, from Psalm 53, and again from the book of Isaiah. But look at the indictments. Indictment number one, there is no one righteous, no, not one. None righteous, verse 10. Righteousness is uh, to have a right relationship with God. And he says, God looks around the universe and he doesn't find a single person who has a right relationship with him. He finds lots of moral people, finds lots of religious people, he finds lots of other kind of people, but nobody 
who is righteous. So the first count to his indictment is, none of us possesses God's righteousness. Count number two, also in verse 10, there is no one who understands. Now he's not talking about mental uh, understanding here. He's talking about spiritual understanding. It's not that we don't have the mental power to understand what God says in his word, most of it. We don't have the spiritual discernment to understand what God says in his word. In fact, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, speaks about people having their understanding darkness, darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardening of their heart. There is just this veil that comes over people's faces that they do not understand what God has to say to them. They don't even understand they need a Savior. And until that veil is removed, this count of this indictment is true for all of us. So we've looked at two counts of the indictment. Let's look at verse 11, count number three. There is no one who seeks God. Now, Paul's quoting here from uh, the Old Testament, Psalm 53. I've asked several of our study group here in our study room to be prepared to read some of the verses that support what Paul is saying here. Charlotte's is going to read our first verse, and that's Psalm 53, verses 2 and 3. God looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Did you notice the universal words there? All fallen away, no one who does good. All have become corrupt. Naturally, we do not seek God. I mean, look, there are 22 million people a day go into McDonald's. There are not 22 million people a day who go into church or who go into the Word of God to seek God. And we know that to be a fact. 83% of all teenagers opt out of church by age 16. Why? Because we don't naturally seek God. In fact, the Bible tells us very clearly, unless the Spirit draws us, we never come to Him. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus. So, third count to his indictment is, left alone, no one would ever try to rectify the problem that we have in the fact that we have no righteousness. Well, here's count number four. They have all gone out of their way, verse 12 says. Gone out of their way. Now, the expression here is, um, is a picture of a camel caravan. Camel caravan sets a route out across the desert. And the camels know exactly where to go, and so do the camel herders. But if you deviate from that path, that means you've gone out of the way. You are not heading toward where the intended destination is. That's the picture that he uses here. They're off the path. People like you and me have gotten off the path to God. We've created our own paths. We've listened to the path of someone else. And so we're um, journeying on our own journey, our own way, going our own destination, and not finding God in the process. What we're talking about here are people who do not know the way that leads to God. Now, that doesn't mean they're not intelligent people. It just means they're spiritual morons. They, they, don't, they don't have a clue spiritually what it is that leads to God. Why? Because they cannot find God in this book. So now we've seen four indictments to this uh, charge that he makes. Here's number five, also in verse 12. They have together become unprofitable. That is to say, uh, the word here is the word that would be used of soured milk. And not that milk is not bad, but if you let it sour, there's not a great deal you can do with it. You certainly can't drink it. So what he's saying here is we have created in our own lives a certain unprofitability toward God. Uh, because of our own sin, God has designed us to be useful to him, to bring praise to him, bring glory to him, to help others come to him. But our own sin keeps us from doing that. So we're kind of like sour milk to God. Uh, we're good, but unprofitable. Therefore, he says in this indictment, uh, we're not good at all because sour milk is of no good to us. And then number six, there is none who does good, no, not one. Verse 12 again. Uh, now, remember, when he says none who does good, that doesn't mean you can't do good things. Salvation Army does good things. You know, um, people who help uh, children, uh, feed the hungry, those are all good things. Uh, you helping your neighbor, those are good things. What he's meaning here is we can't do anything spiritually good that buys us any chips, that, that gives us any stock with God. There is nothing we can do spiritually that will take away the stain of our sin. 
And that's why he uses this as one of the indictments. Uh, Olive, would you read for us uh, Psalm 14, verse 1. Listen carefully to the last part of this verse. Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. Yeah. There is none who does good. There is none who does good. That means me. <laughs> and it means you. And what we're finding in the Bible is many places where the Bible says each of us needs a Savior. None of us, left to ourselves, can make it to heaven on our own. Well, we've only looked at six of the 14 indictments. We have a number to go, and I'll be back in just a minute to consider the last of these indictments. I don't have time to read my Bible. I do a lot of praying. I hate reading. Period. There's just too much going on. It doesn't make sense. I try to read. I, do, I just get distracted. I have no time. I just don't have the time. I just don't have any time. I have no time. They're not excuses. We know. It's life. But what if we told you there was a way to have the Bible dropped in your lap every day? At your convenience. Because there is. 411god.net Let's just start a habit. We'll call you, and you'll get the Bible in your life every day. It's just 60 seconds, but it'll change your life. What do you got to lose? 411god.net Write it down. 411god.net Well, today we're in chapter 3 of the book of Romans. We're looking at the 14 counts to the indictment that Paul brings against all of humanity. Now, he's made the charge. The charge is we're all under sin. We're under the penalty of sin. Now, he has to prove that charge. And an indictment are specific ways in which the charge can be proved. So, there are 14 of them. We're now at number 7. If you have a Bible and are following along, we're at verse 13 of Romans chapter 3. Number seven in his 14 counts of the indictment, their throat is an open tomb. Now, if you've noticed, all the indictments so far, all the counts to the indictment so far have been general. Now he's going to begin to talk about one particular organ of the body that gets us in more trouble than any other, and that's the mouth, the tongue. He says, their throat is like an open graveyard. They have graveyard throats. He's not talking about bad breath here. He's talking about a bad speech here. You know, we flatter with our tongues. Uh, with our tongues, we both curse people and flatter them at the same time. Uh, as a young man growing up, I, I think the most disappointing thing in my early years when I was in college was when I heard the White House tapes from the Nixon era and heard how many expletives had to be deleted from those tapes. What it tells me is this, that the, the indictment that Paul gives here is universally true. We have graveyard throats. What comes out of our mouth tends to be totally inappropriate to God. And then he continues in verse 13, the same theme. With their tongues, they have practiced deceit. In other words, what he's saying is, left to ourselves, we will try to cheat people with our tongues. Ever bought a used car? <laughs> now, I'm not on used car dealers today. Don't worry. But if you bought a used car and got stung, you got a lemon. It's probably because the used car salesman oversold that product. Same thing is true on eBay. Same thing is true everywhere you go. We are deceitful in the way we use our tongues because we want to use our tongues to our advantage, not to the advantage of others. So that's one of the indictments that he brings here. Indictment number nine in verse 13, the poison of snakes or asps is under their lips. Now, Paul, Paul probably has a particular serpent in mind here because um, there's an Egyptian cobra called the Najahadje. Uh, you can see it frequently chiseled into the stones in Egypt, both the upper Nile and the lower Nile. And this Najahadje is, um, uh, carries uh, venom sacs under its chin, and, and when the teeth of the Najahadje comes in and infects you and bites you, uh, that's when the venom is released, and that's when you die. And that's what he says here. The poison of asps is under their lips. It's like we have poisonous tongues. The things we do, the things we say that destroy people's lives. We are equally 
guilty just as a Najahaje would be, uh, the, the asp, the cobra would be. Now, there are other references to this, and uh, I'm going to ask Anil if he'll read one for us. Psalm 140, verse 3, David is talking about evil men. Listen to what David says in Psalm 140 about the evil of people. They make their tongue sharp as serpents, and under their lips is the venom of asps. Yeah, just exactly what Paul said. But Paul probably knew this psalm, and as a result, he quotes David here when he says, the poison of asps is under their lips. Well, he goes on and talks about the tongue for the tenth count of the indictment. You see it as well in verse 14. He says, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. What comes out of the mouth is really uh, very, very wicked sometimes. In fact, Psalm 10, verse 7 says that the mouths of the wicked are full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is the trouble of iniquity. Well, Paul says, look, left to ourselves, we will curse, we will be bitter, we will say things that we wish we hadn't said. And that happens to all of us. Sometimes we just have a sharp word to a child or a sharp word to a friend, and oh, we wish we could take that word back. But it's, it's, it's symptomatic of the entire human race. And what he is saying here, let me give you examples, Paul says, of why I say we are all under sin. And the examples are the counts of his indictment. Well, there are only a couple left. Verse 15 gives us the 11th count of this indictment. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Paul's likely quoting here from Isaiah chapter 59, verses 7 and 8. And Jim is going to read that for us. Their feet run to evil, and they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, desolation, and destruction are in their highways. The way of peace they do not know. There is no justice in their paths. They have made their roads crooked. No one who treads on them knows peace. Yeah, have, did you notice the f expression in there that their thoughts are the thoughts of wickedness? Now, you, you can say, hey, that's not true, unless, of course, you pick up the morning newspaper. I mean, all the kinds of senseless, violent crime we see every day is just an absolute depiction of what is being said here. You know, last year in the United States alone, 1,311 young people under the age of 19 were charged with murder. In the mind of the average individual today is the potential to hatch a plan to kill a lot of people. So what he says in his indictment here uh, is absolutely true today as it was in Paul's day. Well, number 12 of the 14-count indictment is found in verse 16. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Now, I think we have to understand this in the active sense. Uh, these people that he's talking about, and that's you and me, these people that he's talking about actively try to find a way to ruin the lives of other people. I mean, we go out of our way to make things difficult for our neighbor, our parents, sometimes our friends. Count number 13, verse 17. The way of peace they have not known. Now we have uh, this tall building on the East River in the, in the uh, city of New York called the United Nations. The, one of the sole goals of the United Nations is to perpetuate peace in the world. And yet, in over 3,600 years of recorded history, we have had only a total of 292 years without a war. And, and that goes on today. Uh, wars are being fought on almost uh, multiple fronts today because the way of peace, these people, these human beings, you and me, have not known. We just don't know how to get along with each other because of the sin that's in our lives. Well, that brings us to the last count of his indictment. You find it in verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, I have to tell you, this is the basis for all the other counts of the indictment. The reason all the 13 things he says are true is because number 14 is true. There is no fear of God. Fear of God here means the uh, appreciation, the reverence for who God is. We uh, treat God as if he didn't exist, and then we wonder why people act like animals. Now, what Paul is saying here is, I've shown you 14 different occasions, 14 different ways in which it's true that we are all under the penalty of sin. Now, he's pretty thorough on this. Did you notice, verses 10 through 12, he says that man is depraved in his character. Our characters are depraved, sinful. 
And then in verses 13 and 14, our conversation, what we say, is sinful and depraved. And then 15 through 18, it's our conduct that's depraved. We are depraved in our character, we're depraved in our conversation, we're depraved in our conduct. And theologians have a word for that. The word is we are totally depraved. Every area of our life is touched by our own sin. Well, I said there are four uh, ways that he uses the courtroom drama here. We've looked at two of them. Look at verse 19. Here's the opportunity for a defense. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. The opportunity is given for a defense, but every mouth is stopped. That means it's plugged right up. We are mum before God. There is no defense that we can offer in the courtroom of God for our actions. Why? Because our actions are sinful. It was the uh, great uh, French writer and philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau who said, uh, by the way, he uh, shunned wedlock and he, he encouraged his kids to do the same thing. Jean-Jacques Rousseau said, I will stand before God and defend my actions. Well, I have bad news for Rousseau. When he stands before God, he won't have a thing to say. The mouth will be stopped. And that means the only thing left is the verdict. And you see the verdict in verse 20. Therefore, as a result of this courtroom procedure, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. The verdict here is guilty. And it has to be guilty. Because by doing things, we can never justify ourselves. And that's what the... The person who doesn't know the Lord Jesus has tried to do. That's what the moral person's tried to do. That's what our Jewish friends try to do. The things of the law. And Paul comes to the conclusion, by no deeds of any law can anyone ever be justified. Now what Paul is saying here is pretty clear. If we needed a defense, God would have sent us an attorney. If we needed educated, God would have sent us an educator. If we needed to have our heads on straight, God would have sent us a therapist. But what we needed was forgiveness. And so God sent us a Savior. Romans 3 tells us just how very needy we are for a Savior. And the good news is, before we finish Romans 3, we're going to find out who that Savior is. Questions? Tammy. Dr. Kroll, how do you communicate these 14 counts to someone that isn't a believer that says, I don't believe this, I'm a, I'm a good person, this isn't me. And I'm thinking of a, a college literature class that I had where the professor had us read a story to point this very thing out, how depraved mm -hmm. we are. And probably 99% of the people, if not more, in that class argued pretty diligently with, with him that we are good at the core yeah. and only certain things, you know, in our life would make us, you know, be depraved and evil. Yeah. Uh, my advice would be just smack them right in the face. <laughs> <laughs> now, you better not do that. But if they responded adversely to you, you would prove your point immediately. I'm, I, I wouldn't suggest you do that. What you might do, though, is just say, hey, read the newspaper with me. Because on the front page, every day of every newspaper in the world, Almost all 14 of these things are true. Now, they're going to say, but that's not me, and you need to ask, why is this not you? You know, If it's true of people you don't know, and they would argue the same thing, that's not me, and next day they're making the front page. I think we've, we've grown a society today that is blind to its own faults. And you know, we've been so affirming to children that you're doing a good job even if you're failing that when they get to be adults, they think they're doing a good job at living, even if they're failing. Another thing you could do is ask their spouse uh, how they're doing. Uh, I'm sure he or she would uh, quickly tell you. But yeah, it's, it's more difficult today to prove to people that they are sinners because we've grown a whole generation of people who just believes what I do is not sin. It's just what I do. But what they forget is what they do impacts everybody else around them. Jim. Dr. Kroll, in regards to this, uh, I think, and in, in kind of follow up on Tammy's question, uh, a lot of our culture today 
we see so much of this happening in our courtrooms today. We plea bargain everything, yeah. and, and we figure that we're going to be able to plea bargain with God when it comes time to stand before him. Yeah, and that's why I think uh, the expression that Paul uses here, that every mouth will be stopped. Uh, the word stopped here doesn't just mean we can't say anything. It means our mouth is stuffed right full that we can't even squeak. Uh, the whole process here is a, a process that is legal and justifiable. Uh, an opportunity for a defense is given, but the fact of the matter is um, there isn't anything we can say. In, in light of a holy God, there isn't anything we can say that can bring us even an inch closer to that holy God. Well, I hope you're enjoying our current series. But if you missed a few lessons or you want to share Dr. Kroll's messages with a friend, then why not order the entire series on DVD? It's easy. Just call back to the Bible at 888-430-2525. That's 888-430-2525. iPod, YouTube, MySpace. We want it our way and we want it right now. We want. We want. It's all about me. Right now, right here. My, my friends, friends, my, my family, family, my needs, needs my, my wants, wants, my problems. I know. I, I live like this too. These 30 seconds won't change your life. But maybe this will. Maybe he will. Look past the here. Look past the now. Past yourself. NotReligion.com. NotReligion.com. Well, Dr. Kroll, I have to be honest with you, it was hard to sit through uh, this, this teaching today because as you went down those indictments, I was saying, I, I don't want to be that, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to find every uh, kind of justification that that wasn't me, but it is. Mm -hmm. So and then you get down to verses 19 and 20, and it's just like you're bringing the hammer down in more and more and more. So as a listener today is probably feeling the same way, what do you say to them? Because it's a little bit yeah. depressing where we ended. Yeah, it is. And, uh, you know, there's a whole lot more to say than what we said today. I, I think Paul's point here is this. We really do have to recognize there's bad news before we can appreciate there's good news. Uh, because people who think everything is fine, you know, nobody really is a sinner. People basically are good are never going to come to the point where they need a savior. And so what Paul is doing is he's moving logically through the whole process. Now, right now, we're in the process of finding out how bad things are. In fact, how bad we are. But the good news is this. He doesn't stop there. And in fact, he doesn't even stop there in chapter 3. Tomorrow, we're going on to find out how to become righteous like God. Okay, I'm not like God today, but I can become like God. And God has an answer to my problem. Unfortunately for all of us, we have to wait until tomorrow to find it out. So make sure you're back tomorrow because there is good news coming. It's coming in the rest of Romans chapter 3. Well, thanks to all of you for being a part of our discussion today and for you at home joining us as well. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Woodrow Kroll. Have a good and godly day. <laughs>